my talk will be in English. I will give the um, translators uh, lots of fans and a big audience. Um, at the conference material organized earlier this year in the, at the University of Aachen, two of the architects presenting expressed their concern on the complexity of the contemporary building industry. And as an alternative, they both refer to the notion of einfach bauen, which is called simple building, the idea to develop monolithic building systems that can innovate and simplify the building process. And it's not unusual that material innovations are motivated as an improvement to existing practices, but the einfach bauen concept has an added dimension because it intentionally embraces the gesture of building in its archaic dimensions. That's the not the first time you see this, um, because it touches on a fundamental architectural project. It's the question of the first dwelling or the primitive hut. Architectural historian Joseph Rickward saw the search for the first hut as an innate desire for societies to renew the validity of your actions as a, for the French, reculer pour mieux sauter. Likewise, material innovations have to be validated before they can become part of an architectural culture. And this text, this talk, will look at the concrete case of a building made of an einfach bauen, monolithic material, and it will demonstrate that its reference to the origins of building um, is used as a way to legitimize the new material and to create meaning, both in an architectural and a cultural sense. And I will do this by uh, ways of comparing uh, my case study with the several instances of the history of the primitive hut. So first, the case study. Uh, it's Parasite, it's a festival for alternative types of dwelling. The Dutch-German office, Korteknie Stuhlmacher Architects, KZ, it builds this small pavilion on the top of an empty warehouse. It's 1992 and they've just set up office in Rotterdam. And the festival formulated a critique on what was then known as uh, the super Dutch, the Dutch landscape. Um, they were very dominant at that time and they had a sort of quite provocative rhetoric, no money, no details. They had a focus on the exterior and they relied very much on the idea of concept. So KZ constructed the small pavilion out of one material, cross-laminated timber, which is what you see here. It's an innovative material. It's a wood-based plate. It's made from, from solid sawn cross-laminated uh, lumber. You could see it as a sort of a blown-up multiplex. CLT can be used for lots of things, the walls, the floors, the partition walls and roofs, and even stairs and furniture. The construction has to be cladded outside for weather protection, but the interior does not need any finishing, thus offering the possibility to reveal the spruce patterns. The choice for this material that was not culturally occupied, as Stuhlmacher describes it, was a very conscious one. And then we go to the primitive hut. Wood also played an important role in two of architecture's most influential primitive buildings. Here you see Logier's primordial hut and Sampa's Caribbean hut. Logier's hut, for one, formed an argument in the search for the foundations of the discipline, which Logier sought in the art of mimesis. But he did not mean the imitation in the Renaissance tradition, art in the service of some sort of civic goal, but as an autonomous discipline. Architecture was the material art of construction, and it should imitate nature, and therefore the wooden beams, the first hut, came from the forest, both pre present in this etching on the cover of Logier's famous book in 1755. And his wooden hut, and it was wood, was an encouragement for architects to base their work on the laws of nature, instead of the classical orders that had so far been the, uh, the subject of architectural treatises. For Logier, the hut was true perfection. And then we make a jump, 50 years later. Quatremer de Quincy, 
He did not describe the primitive hut as, a, as an actual physical building, but he and many with him still saw wood as the primordial material. And the evidence for this, he found in the fact that all primitive societies made their first shelters from wood. But unlike Logier, Quatremer did not believe in the absolute and supreme quality of the first hut. He considered it a mere starting point from which all architecture had developed. And we go to Semper. And Semper, 50 years later, picked up on the concept of architecture as this continuous development. Um, and he developed this idea of the Stoffwechsel, or material metamorphosis. And Stoffwechsel describes the transfer of forms from one material to another, where the memory of the first material is inscribed in the new material. The manufacturing process of the first is symbolized in the details or the ornament of the latter. For Semper, Stoffwechsel was a creative pro process where technical means become cultural science and where buildings become architecture. And he thought this was how architecture developed. And he used the example of the Caribbean hut to describe how each of the materials used to fit its technical capacity. But at the same time, there was something else. He considered the hut as an architectural reading of humans' actions and rituals. So wood was the tectonic form, the primitive system, reserved for the construction and the roof of the house, but its main function was to provide a shelter for the act of dwelling. This is more like an anthropologist view. Then we go back to the present. The story of the primitive hut draws parallels to Keisei's little hut. To start with, their choice for wood is similarly motivated as Logier's. It was a strategic decision and part of a specific argument against the current practice. Here you see MVRDV, very famous uh, super Dutch, where the materials used doesn't really matter. Wood is a living material with distinct qualities and associations and able to evoke a natural atmosphere of the vernacular house. But it's more offers, wood offers more than mere symbolism. It also formulates a strategy to resist the building industry. Uh, the, in the Dutch situation, contractors do the work with wood, but in the form of these prefabricated panels, which you can see above. They're mass-produced and standardized in detailing, leaving no room, according to Stuhlmacher, to the Id idiosyncratic and the eccentric. The office appreciates CLT for its solid, solid appearance in contrast to these prefabricated timber elements. The wood therefore serves also another part of their agenda, that of making buildings with a distinct atmosphere. KSA has tested the, uh, the aesthetic qualities of CLT in a number of projects. They have discovered that the light in wooden interiors works very different from regular stucco interiors, giving a distinct character to every room. The shiny effect of the wood is enhanced by a certain positioning of the light, and floodlight highlights the wood grain. And the wooden planks give a sense of scale to the room, and the wood guarantees an optimized interior climate. But now back to the technical properties of the materials. Because as I explained earlier, CLT is made of cross-glued wooden battens. So it has structural properties that challenge the traditional application of wood, which is of course usually with beams. And there, Quatremer and Semper's conception of materialization as a process in development is relevant. Uh, you have to understand that CLT was developed in the 1990s as an alternative to wet concrete slabs which disturbed the dry building flow of the carpenters. So it's an alternative to concrete. And therefore, KSA turned to a small concrete building for their reference. The architect Leverens Flower Kiosk at the East Cemetery in Malmö of 1969. It's an extremely reduced building, as you can see, and it's made from solid concrete walls, bare windows, and a tilted copper roof with large overhang. In this primitive hut, Keise found the unity of construction, space, and material 
that they aim for in their own buildings. So the flower kiosk's slab tectonics uh, is embraced in the parasite pavilion. So the plates are assembled atectonically, connected to the floors and rooms with very simple invisible steel angles and to each other with bolted strips of wood, um, you see in the left, to form a stable ensemble. According to Stuhlmacher, the lack of tectonic expression brings on a certain abstraction that prioritizes the spatial experience. The simple construction allowed them to control over all aspects of building, and it's also a way to get craftsmanship uh, back into it, dealing directly with the wood firm in all their projects. Similar to the concrete in the flower kiosk on the left, uh, that forms both facades and interiors, the CLT is used as construction and lining. The imprint of the plywood formwork in the flower kiosk left becomes the wooden battens of the CLT. You can see at some corners the head end of the plates. I can do this, no, hold on. Yeah, here you can see it. Uh, is kept inside to reveal the composition of the material. And both in Keze and the flower kiosk, the ornament arises out of the primitive necessities of building, to distribute electricity over the room, to insulate it, to take acoustic measures, fire hose, all affirming what the building has to do. In that sense, both pavilions both pavilions are primitive huts, architecture that takes a step back from the jump, before the jump, solid buildings, no cladding, archaic gestures indeed. In Leverand's case, the intention was a very radical one, the complete deconstruction of the architectural object in its materialization and detailing. The windows, as you can see, are roughly glued on the concrete with black sealant and steel fittings to tie the glass. And the black door is floating in a concrete wall, and a large roof is loosely put on top. The insulating material still visible in the interior, and there are no drain pipes. All elements are equally important, using the plywood formwork with edges chamfered to render the making process visible. The level of abstraction puzzles the viewer and introduces a new playing field in claiming an absolute architectural autonomy, a bit like Loger did. But then Keze has a different intention. I would say referring more to Semper's Caribbean hut. Semper's claim was that the beginning of architecture should not be sought in the hut itself, but in the circumstances that shaped it. The ritual of dwelling determined material choices and construction techniques, not the architectural rules themselves. Keze ultimately selected the material so they could make char characterful houses with a strong material existence. The turn from exterior to interior demonstrates that the ritual of dwelling is valued over the picture book image of the Super Dutch. Keze made many more projects with CLT after this, integrating it into their practice, modifying and refining the detailing. They've learned to balance the material to avoid overpowering the wood appearance and adding other materials, more subdued in material expressions, like the gray floor. Do you see here? Uh, sometimes also contrasting the very atectonic expression of the CLT with tectonic elements, as you can see here, uh, the columns and beams in the veranda of one of their later projects that add another layer to architecture. Am I my last slide? Am I doing fine time-wise? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Rickward makes the case that the primordial hut is not a concrete architectural project, but is rather a quest for principles. Both the flower shop and the little hut of Keze, they don't question a material, but a principle. They use it in new ways for strategic reasons. They test it for its atmospheric and haptic potential, and with de you de use detailing that builds on existing technical and cultural knowledge. And by using the tools of abstraction and deconstruction, they recalibrate the material. 
by offering alternatives to existing architectural cultures and conventions, they make us conscious of what architecture can offer and provides us with tools to reinvigorate the discipline. And they may find support from unexpected source. I stumbled upon the Davo Declaration of 2018 uh, on Baukultur in Europe, and it states, high quality Baukultur is expressed in the application of a conscious and well-debated design to every building and landscaping activity. And they prioritize cultural values over short-term economic gains. Material practice, practices are an indispensable ingredient of this building culture and deserve to be debated. For quoting Stuhlmacher, at the end of the day, architecture consists of only material. Thank you. Translators, I hope I didn't speak too quickly. The hut, the tent, the igloo, the hut are architectural models that have in common to belong to, belong to the same family of prime habitats. These prime habitats are dwellings which relate to an ancestral way of life, just like makeshift dwellings, which are in fact built by deprived populations who are characterized by a constructive mode of do-it-yourself that Claudie Strauss designated in Wild Thoughts as a first activity. These dwellings are also the first relationship with the environment, with the need for shelter adapted to weather conditions, and which bring resources within reach. This first character is not exclusively to be considered in accordance with temporality, the habitat of the first men, but also according to a hierarchy of vital imperatives at stake in the habitat of the favelas, which are the result of emergency and precarious situations. The body expresses fundamental needs to which dwellings of this type can offer an immediate answer, even if it is a summary one. The wall constructions that emerge here and there in the neglected spaces of our metropolises have in common with the cabin of the origins to be concerned, among other things, neither by comfort offered by technology nor access to uh, current consu consumer goods. They embody two registers of otherness which have been called to mind by the art historian Hal Foster in The Return of the Real, the Economic and Cultural. At the same time, we are talking about the uh, other who is the poor or the isolated. And uh, Hal Foster shows how this logic is developed in contemporary art. Among the many actors who are interested in the question of living, philosophers, sociologists, architects, you have the artists. And in the second half of the 20th century, their mobilization on the subject led to the production of many installations which borrowed their form or designation from archetypal figures, such as the hut and the igloo in Mariomance, the hut at Daniel Buren, or the tent uh, for Carla Accardi. Now, this mobilization was also reflected in the borrowing of ephemeral construction processes, processes such as DIY and recycling with Tadashi Kawamata, for example, or the implementation strategies in a specific environment, such as the one set up by Rikit Tiravanya in the, in the land in Thailand in cooperation with some architects, or in the uh, Yer Joshua Tree Desert in California. I propose we question here the evolution of the meaning given to the recourse of archetypal figures of inhabiting and the process of archaic constructions in the field of art, and this in resonance with practices and productions of the architectural sector. You need to know that in 1960, special interest by artists for these types of housing is shared by the architects, by 
the mid-1950s in the brutalism in architecture, Rainer Benham noted an archaic trend in architecture. For Bruno Zani, the convocation of the Habitat of the First Men then fed the criticism of the models resulting from post-industrial culture. And this was illustrated in the comparison between a Tunisian dwelling and the re, uh, a work by uh, Robert Frey. Both of these joined Germano Selent, an art theoretician who highlighted the critical position of Arte Povera with a regard to minimal art. This appeals to an archetype such as the Hut, which implies interest in what adheres to the form of posture as well as the form itself and its use. We know that the archetype of the cabin conveys values in Western society, a utopia, a way of life and construction that is supposed to be in harmony with nature and its rhythms. You know that literature uh, refers us back to Walden, for example. Along with the development of cities and consumer society, the cabin has become one of the emblems of marginality or freedom, depending on whether this difference is either a chosen one or a suffered one. Nicolas Bourriot, critic and art theorist, enlightened us when he explains that the stakes of an era in which artists claimed the primitive spirit in reaction to the world of the machine, hyperconsumption, and clean. He says, we begin to perceive the ambiguity on which the commerce of the primitive object rests. Western art will then draw on this diversity of forces irreducible to commercial circulation. That is to say, the festive, ephemeral, and magical dimensions of tribal societies. Land art, or body art, in which we can perceive echoes of primitivism, denies the belonging of art to the world of objects to connect it to that of ceremony or sacred spaces. The hut and the TP are then summoned in art, not as an object, but rather as an agent collaborating in the community and festive dimension that was evoked by Nicolas Bourriot. Looking beyond the symbolic aspect of this type of dwelling, the hut, in its construction principles and derived forms refers, of course, to the collage assembly assimilated to the artistic practice of people such as Picasso and Braque. This can then add to the status of work of art in a certain way. Now, Jean-Charles de Paul has developed this point of view as regards the field of architecture in his thesis, The Savages of Architecture, which highlights in art brut, a non-scholar practice of construction, instinctive without means, but vibratal and directly connected to the sensitive. Several approaches are, in, are intertwined. On the one hand, the question of form and its production, which can be assimilated to a work or artistic practice. And on the other hand, symbolism, which is attached to this form, related to a way of life socially, geographically, culturally, historically, politically, or economically. Now, the move towards these uh, models is part of a recurring process of creation, which is that of the eternal return. This return to the sources cyclically accompanies architecture and art in their theoretical material production and acts as a guardian of certain values as well as a regenerative impulse. In his book, The House of Adam in Paradise, Reichwert evokes about evokes it about the primitive cabin, which is inseparably testimony of the past and guide for the future. In soliciting the forms and principles emanating from prime habitats, contemporary artists since the 1990s are expressing more than just nostalgia or a simple challenge. They first of all affirm a desire for renewal that involves living as a form, use, and state. Mario Mertz's work, which began then in the 1960s, anticipates on a new contemporary subject that is the relationship of man to nature and its environment through human habitation. The elements such as water, the fire, the earth are thus summoned by the artist Marie Trappiorque or Xavier Villon. 
both speak of the relationship to the element and its ability to mobilize individuals, for example, grouping together around fire or hierarchization around a territory. And this refers to access to water, of course, especially with regards to favelas. Now, if Mario Mertz develops the work of sculptures and installations, of which you have the series of igloos, in fact, these are never inhabited. For him, the igloo is a form of integrity. And he is going to explore the igloo from a plastic approach, looking at the fragmentation and this within the framework of the minimalist trend. Today and since the 1990s, a certain number of artists wish to uh, build a concrete uh, space for, relation, for the relationship and exchange with art. The renewal, in fact, is going to undertake an analysis. Uh, far from the utopia and challenges of the 1960s, since the 1990s, artists take reality as it is and modify modify it or question it. They invest in the field and move art to the field of ethnography to resume Hal Foster's analysis in the return of the real. He speaks of the practice of a participatory observation. And Malgeti Capot replicates in the galleries of the constructions observed in the reality of desolate territories. She will observe uh, uh, these uh, shanty towns in building ed edifices. Here you have an installation by Magitika Potre, which is called the core unit. And it was uh, part of a project for uh, aid to uh, habitat for those who have the most difficulty in uh, housing themselves with, in fact, a water point upon which the inhabitants can extend the uh, dwelling. André Zita launched a project on a territory on the basis of his, uh, in fact, reflection of the Five Acre Homestead Act. The Five Acre Homestead Act was a provision whereby people were given a portion of territory in exchange for building a dwelling. This uh, system uh, generated uh, these uh, dwellings, and uh, he, in fact, he installed his studio on the site so as to be able to carry out experiments in uh, direct contact with a number of points like the uh, energy in the desert, enabling Andrea to produce materials. Eric Tiravaniva uh, is going to carry out experimentation in a Thai village, and there they would uh, work the rice paddies, and this was created with artists and architects. They built dwellings using the uh, for the strength and power of animals here, and here they were working totally autonomous from the use of electricity. All of these constructions deploy experiments and experiences which can be directly linked to reality. And Nicolas Burio calls this a relational uh, ethic. This production is, in fact, going to reveal the fundamental act of building and building oneself, and this using materials and building processes through collection, do it yourself, uh, and collage. And this is also going to be based on time and ephemeral architecture based on cycles and the ephemeral. They also work in relation to the environment and a specific territory. Through forms and archaic processes, artists seem to work on a plasticity of reality, relaunching a social questioning which is fundamental and which is open to a, a creation of new parameters. This approach has to be put into a line with a world which is uh, calling upon the preservation of the body 
And this is expressed, in fact, in art and goes beyond the archetypal uh, aspects of architecture. Thank you. Merci, uh, pour cette belle présentation. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation for having respected your time. Now we're going to hear Eric de Toisy, who is a researcher in architecture. He has a philosophical and uh, informatics approach. In 2018, he completed a doctoral thesis on architecture and the laboratory. And he worked with CIFRE and at the SCAU architectural firm. Indeed, it's important to state that ESCO is partner of this work, remarkable for a dissertation crossing architecture and philosophy. My work deals generally with the way the digital background as a cultural background is producing something in architecture and the signification of architecture, the capacity of architecture to signify something at the least. And uh, in relation with those two days, the idea was to wonder or ask whether this demand for a new way of initiality can be encompassed in the passage from a technical to a digital passage technique. I started by being interested in the uh, learning spaces libraries. This one that you all have seen, one of the most commented projects of the past years. The reception of the project was interesting in two stages. One received with a certain measure characterizing the critics, the most beautiful library in the world, and so on and so forth. Well, friends and pals, okay? And uh, this kind of enveloping architecture curve that the architect Winnie Maas is convoking two figures to describe this library, the cave. It's like a cave. It's the reactualization of this primitive or archaic figure regarded as a starting point from a certain point of view of the architecture. It's architecture as an envelope, making the difference between inside, outside, human, inhuman. Ortega y Gasset says in College City, a separate enclosure that is purely human and signifying the human, designing the human, pointing at the human. What was interesting is that the walls of the cave are covered of books. I mean, they're made of books in line with the second figure that is re required by the architect. It's the eye. That's the name he gives to the central form. All this matter, memorial matter, which is covering the walls, is visible from everywhere. And uh, it's the second responsibility, historic responsibility, of the architect in the certain classical thought, which is signified not only by the human space, but the human space with whatever happened inside, its history, legacy. This is what Mac Marshall McLuhan says in, in the book of Eshamayev, architecture as a reconstitution, visual reconstitution of the past. It's interesting. I'll do it quickly. Link this kind of formalism, architectural formalism, with the background of production for the past 20 years, more or less, coming from what you call the digital architecture, Marcus Novak, Greg Lynn, who have an ambiguous attitude between virtual and real space with those curve enclosures and something you find also in buildings physical like Foster, a library in Berlin, 
the BFU, with this very closed shape, very curved. And Foster is interesting because it gives us another way, another shape of this envelope. It's not exactly the same, but you have it in an enclosure, very uh, clear between an inside and an outside space. Then, can we consider that there is a uh, Restatement, starting from the same archaic figure, MVRDV is very interesting because there was a sudden second time of reception of the project when after a few days of visit the journalists and critics became aware that the books were not real books. And that was just a little testimony in the profession that is testifying of a little problem. Is there something and the return in the uh, restatement of this enveloping figures that doesn't work anymore, since architecture is condemned to look alike. The assumption that I wish to suggest is this crisis of signification must be caught, must be understood from a technical culture to a digital culture. I suggest to move in the comparison between Jacques Ellul and A.M. Turing. Jacques Ellul, thinker of technique, theology, who wrote nice things about theology and technique, saying, writing that technique and architecture are the products of a single history, the same creation by Cain, Adam and Cain, yeah, right? The first creator, that's the, the shape of the envelope and the rooting, fusis. Tectonia. What's interesting is right before, it's the fall of human being and what causes the, the fall in his reading of Genesis is the recognition of being naked and the recognition of the otherness of the genders, masculine and feminine. Why do I get back to that? Because Adam Turing that can be regarded as the founding father of the digital culture in this text of 1950, the most significant, and the, the game, the imitation game, there's a work rather complex, technical, philosophical, literary, in which he tries to see if we can go beyond intelligence towards machines, or more generally speaking, if we can detach the notion of intelligence from a substrate, either machine, human, but human uh, gender, masculine and feminine, and there's this little game, a man, woman, and machine, and the three together play and have to uh, find out or, or make believe, and the first stage of the game is precisely man making believe to the woman that he's not a man. And it's precisely a thought about the annihilation of recognizing the otherness of the gender. Not the annihilation of the gender, but the annihilation of the recognition of the gender, which is much more interesting. So we can come up with the assumption that there is maybe a new digital history starting precisely with this stage which enables all the rest of the games, starting with the annihilation of the founding assumption of history, of the previous history. The case of Foster didn't take it by chance, because it's even most, more interesting if you zoom out. And you see he inserted his envelope with the, within Enforce, within the architecture which is produced in a very different era in the 60s to the 70s, a crisis in architecture that Jacques Lucan discussed yesterday. And there was a certain type of production. He was saying something different about architecture, the capacity of architecture to signify. There were also some theoretical researches on the signification with Charles Yangs and other people. What's really, really interesting is that those projects were produced at the time of sharing theoretical and practical between 
IT specialists and architects. IT was built as a mimesis, an imitation of architecture. Well, I have no time to uh, drill down, but moving from IT architecture, see the change of meaning, is the most visible uh, testimony of this history recent history, and to try to find a rigorous background of repositioning of signification. It's an example of what happened in those times with Nicolas Negroponte. I suggest to go to the most complex part of the digital, which is the most important one and the most structuring, is the computational model that was suggested by Turing in 36 in his dissertation, doctoral dissertation. It's difficult, but it's the suggestion of a new form of logic thinking at the base of the functioning of all the machines today. It's a logic, formal th thought inherited from the history of mathematics, but Turing displaces things. He builds this logical thinking as a reconversion of the way the human being is thinking, very important for him. What's of interest for me is the notion of signification. It is not taken out of the model of thought, but it's not thought as an explicit, but as an implicit of the model. He says we didn't attribute any signification, a meaning, and we don't want to do it. But he says we will be led to use some formulas. If not, we'll leave them without an explicit signification or meaning. An explicit one can be suggested, or an implicit one can be suggested. I do it quickly, quickly, but it's very interesting to put in parallel Turing and Wittgenstein, who knew each other. Turing spent one year in Cambridge after his uh, dissertation, doctoral thesis, and the lessons of Wittgenstein uh, reminding some uh, discussions, fascinating discussion between them. The, the, the sliding from implicit to explicit or from explicit to implicit, the meaning is not a given of the uh, thought, but as linked to the use you do with the model of thought, of logical thought. I'll try to speed up. This new history has an interest for architecture. This is what we may think if you cross those ideas with those of Eisenman, who was telling us in 1992, you're not in a mechanical paradigm where architecture explicitly has the responsibility to signify something, but it announced the electronic paradigm where it says issues like the one of signification are not relevant anymore, but doesn't mean that you do away with it. But according to him, that's what's important. It's about creating a space that doesn't look like meaning anything. I think it's, again, the possibility to think signification as an implicit. If we accept this as a new framework for architecture, is there a new history? Can this explain the return to those archetypal forms? Is now that we are in the Wittgenstein's thought, if we accept it, do we have a more refined framework to think, maybe not the origin of architecture, but the idea of foundation of an architecture, which is something very important in the logical thought of Wittgenstein, foundation and not the origin. This is the starting point. It's undoubtable, but it's in the order of unsaid justified or unjustified. It's not reasonable and not unreasonable. And this, this statement is very interesting to me. Because Fujimoto is convinced that one has to find a new origin for architecture. Lucan noticed it very well in his last book. Fujimoto is part of those who think that we have to retrieve an origin that there is a new history to rewrite, opposing the origin of a traditional thought with the figure of the nest, illustrated by the domino house that we discussed yesterday and Kul has reproduced in Venice. The figure of the nest is a space which is arranged in the 
hostly way. The original space of architecture is already prepared to be inhabited, meaning it is habitable, dwellable. He, he'd rather suggest another origin that seems to him more relevant is the one of the cave, who on the face of it could resemble or look like this one. It's, it's really flabbergasting. And the definition he gives is absolutely unheard of and passionating. Fascinating. He says the cave is something that is already here naturally, independently of the fact that it is being hostly or not, i.e. we are in a space that is neither dwellable nor non-dwellable. It's something that I try to put in line with the foundation, as Wittgenstein understands it. It's neither reasonable or not reasonable. It might be a path to rephrase a thought of the inhabited. It's very ambitious, but, you know, I'll conclude with that. Merci, bonjour. The term generic is typically used to describe architectural works with no distinguishing features. The cookie cutter houses of a suburban development, for example, or nondescript office building along a highway interstate. This pejorative use of the term relies upon the apparent contrast of this architecture with the articulated and original architectural forms valued within 20th century architectural culture. This appellation can be extended to the urban as well. Rem Koolhaas has written about the generic city as a global condition in which cities, like their airports, are all the same. In these examples, the generic is boring and nondescript. It's an unauthored architecture of the banal. My use of the term generic, however, draws from a broader definition as that which is non-specific. In this use of the term, generic is not beige, to use Koolhaas's descriptor, or boring, but simply that which, in its lack of specificity, suggest something more than or beyond what it is. I borrow this term, this use of the term from literary critic Harold Bloom, who's in his books on anxiety of influence, he talks about a, what he calls a revisionary ratio, demonization, which describes the means through which a later poet, and I'll quote here, opens himself to what he believes to be a power in the parent poem that does not belong to the parent proper, but to a range of being just beyond that precursor, end quote. In other words, the later poet finds something in the earlier work that seems bigger than the poem itself. The later poet then, and here I'll quote again, generalizes away the uniqueness, end quote, of the earlier work. So my provocation following Bloom is thus, how might we understand architectural design as an analogous process of generalizing away the uniqueness of earlier works? In the brief time that I have, I will consider three late 20th century architectural works. Lucan's first Unitarian Church in Rochester of 1959, Rossi's Monument to the Resistance in Sigrate of 65, and Venturi's Franklin Court I should say Venturi and Roch, Franklin Court from 1976. In these examples, an architectural past is constructed not through allusions to previous works or conscripting elements from earlier projects, but through articulating and identifying an architectural generic. It is in this creation of the generic that we find the expression of a dehistoricized archaic architectural language. When Lucan was asked to design a church for the Unitarian Congregation in Rochester, New York in 1959, he talked about the fact that he didn't know much about this religion and, and he knew only that they were interested in questions rather than answers. 
This question became the initiator of Kahn's design for the church, and in this well-known form drawing of Kahn's, we see at the center a question mark contained within a square. Around that are concentric circular rings. The innermost space he labels as ambulatory, encircled in turn by a corridor, and finally by another outer ring that represents school. This drawing was not, Kahn asserted repeatedly, a depiction of a solution or a specific plan for the project. Instead, it illustrates what he called form. And form, you may be familiar with, in Kahn's definition is, is precisely opposite of what we typically think of as form, in the sense of form for Kahn is that which comes before design. In his 1961 article, Form and Design, he defined form as order, as harmony, as an underlying sense that has no shape or dimension. So Kahn's form is the opposite of a resolved material thing. Instead, it refers to that which precedes any architectural manifestation. I think here we can see links with Katamerikensi's notion of type, which he defines as that which precedes instantiation. For Katamerik, type is the root of the thing, the originating reason of the thing. I would say here too, the type is not specific, but generic. To make the point uh, that, that form does not, should not suggest the realization of the architecture, Khan first shows us this original plan um, that followed too closely, right? It looks too much like the form diagram, but it doesn't embody yet, it's, it didn't um, completely embody the ideas. He shows us another plan, he says, well, at, then we, you know, it moved farther away. The congregation had different needs. At one point, he draw, drew a new diagram, but in fact, that was that, they, that he ended up going back to the original form diagram, and they reverted back. In other words, the form held, to use Kahn's descriptor. So, like the like the esquisse of the Beaux Arts, right? The form diagram is the measure against which the ultimate design is judged. So the final result then, the architecture, is indebted to this form drawing, but by no means is there a linear progression from drawing to building. The form drawing for Rochester could arguably serve as the form drawing for any number of works. After all, it's generic enough to suggest many outcomes. But the specific architecture that emerges as one possible outcome from it this Unitarian church, also serves to alter that conception of that first form drawing. It's only after the creation of the eventual design that the form drawing becomes its antecedent. So in here, this case, I think the beginning is defined to a certain degree by its end point. So to conclude this con example, I think the power of this is the suggestion of possible outcomes without proclaiming any one. It does not refer to any specific precedent, this form drawing, but instead suggests a generalized idea, which a kind of primordial essence, that which is before architecture. Aldo Rossi's Monument to the Sagrate in Italy, 1965, offers another type of generalizing of the architectural past. Rossi's monument is composed of three elementary volumes cast in rough concrete, which rest on top of one another like oversized children's blocks. A cylinder supports one end of an elongated triangular prism, the other end rests on a rectangular box. The box, which appears closed from one end, we see here on the other side, cleaves open to become two walls with a stair between that leads to a platform at the top. Rossi's extensive writing on the idea of architectural type here offers another insight into the idea of the generic as demonstrated in this project. Rossi defines type as, quote, a logical principle that is prior to form and constitutes it, end quote. Architectural types, the dome, the temple, the basilica, carry the resonance of collective memory. The architect is thus a kind of conduit, allowing these predetermined constant types to emerge and interact with contemporary problems. 
The simple geometric forms at Sagrate, the cube, the prism, the cylinder, can be seen as vessels for this deep historical memory. These seemingly basic forms are deployed precisely for their complex associations. To connect with our earlier talk, certainly there is a loge-like primitive hut sensibility, I would say, the triangular pedimented form placed on top of the cylindrical column. But more fundamentally, I'm arguing that their primitive volumes suggest this generic, unspecified, but highly resonant connection with history. I think it's worth connecting this, if only momentarily, uh, with the, the filibin solids, the platonic filibin solids, which we see here in Le Corbusier's uh, Version Architecture. And I'm not suggesting that Rossi is here in any way providing a kind of catalog uh, akin to Le Corbusier, or that there's a necessarily platonic meditation in the sense of a connection to primal elements, let's say, of earth, air, or fire, but, but instead that Rossi's forms resonate with this deeper architectural meaning, in this case speaking to architecture's own history. So the archaic resides in this project, not in drawing, as we saw with Kahn, but in the architectural work itself. The uniqueness of any particular usage is generalized away in favor of an abstracted geometric solution. A final example of this, what I'm defining as this architectural generic, is maybe a lesser known project. This is a project by Venturi and Rach called Franklin Court, constructed in Philadelphia in 1976 for the American Bicentennial. The firm of Venturi and Roch were asked to design this memorial to Benjamin Franklin on the site of Franklin's original home in downtown Philadelphia. Not much was known of the original structures that occupied the site, so rather than to attempt to rebuild or replicate the existing structure, the architects instead decided to create a pair of what they call ghost structures that suggest the building's original form and location. They're built of tubular painted steel and are essentially three-dimensional outlines of the typical features of a detached single family home. Four walls, a door, chimney, that are outlined in these metal tubes. As in Rossi's monument to the Sicrate, the form suggests something beyond itself in this case, however, that something beyond is both the specific structures that previously occupied the site, but also the idea of house most broadly. The project serves as a kind of diagram, and here is an, an, an actual uh, diagram in Venturi's hand that I found in the archive. And I think there's a sense here of proclaiming, I am a house. Franklin Court is also a generalization of Venturi's own earlier works, particularly the Van Venturi House of 62 and also the Trubeck and Wislowski Houses in Nantucket, 1972. And by that I mean that these projects are all iterations of the same basic idea. So much like the way in which he gathered together historical examples and complexity and contradiction to illustrate a particular concept, I think here, to get taken together these elements in his work, they each take generic, recognizable features of the house, gable roof, chimney, picture windows, et cetera, and deploy them through means which call attention to their convention and shared qualities. Franklin Court is a kind of end point to this inquiry. The idea of houseness is now reduced to the extent that it has no materiality at all, no enclosure, no inside or outside, just an outline of its shape. All we are left with is the essence of houseness. Each of these three projects speaks to the question of the archaic through the expression of the generic. Each complicates the idea of the origin the past is constructed as a non-specific idea, one that precedes architectural form. Each example not only calls upon this generalized notion of the past then, but also determines those generic qualities of the past. What Kahn generalizes away is the necessity of materialization itself, 
The past is no longer constructed as one or many things, but as an idea which precedes things. The end result in Khan is a complex architecture based on simple preform idea. In contrast to Khan's complex form that emerges from a simplifying operation, Rossi's simple forms emerge from a complex meditation on their long-standing cultural value as form, and here I use form in the traditional non kanian sense. Rossi defines basic geometric volumes that are themselves archaicizing elements. They generalize away the uniqueness of historical forms and serve as repositories of associations. Venturi generalizes away the uniqueness of the type itself. He generates an image of a house, pointing to the idea of house without itself taking on the materialization of architecture. So in conclusion, together, these three examples I offer as a provocation to suggest a revisionist narrative of a postmodern historicism, one in which the past is accessed not through historicist pastiche, or through collage, but through meditation on architecture's beginnings through the architectural generic. Thank you. Also uh, teaching at the university in Rabat. Thank you. Uh, Good, uh, good morning. I have a proposal whereby I will stress, in fact, the question of fleshing, which is, in fact, the uh, title of my proposal. I'd like to point out that this is an archaic process that evokes modernity. The archaic concept can take on different uh, forms, according to Le Corbusier, and this can be used to identify uh, several references, uh, especially in the search for classic purity. If we were to quote the antique and the difference of the archaic and the different approaches, on the one hand, you have Janet who studies the classic architecture. Then you have the uh, Voyage d'Orient with Jeanne Ray, who discovers the real nature of archaeology. If we are looking for an archetype, we can find this in the pictures and drawings made during the trip. Here, in his notebook, he's going to uh, write his uh, impressions. The design and photos show his interest in the process of deterioration of material. He is fascinated by architecture in ruins. He looks at nature through the objects, whether we're talking of architecture or objects. It shows a desire to come back to the origin, to the essence uh, and birth of architecture. Because for the first time at the Athens Acropolis, he starts to describe the architecture he sees in the landscapes, and he writes, it's like a tragic, car, say, a tragic carcass, which is enthralling, a tragic symbol of human condition. It is thus that Le Corbusier starts discovering antique architecture and starts seeing all of the archetypes. He is beginning to uh, recognize the basic systems of Greek architecture. 
And in Rome, because in Rome, he finds uh, uh, architecture of interest to him, he can start recalling the words of Viollet le Duc, who he studied before going on this trip, and which uh, indicated a means of discovering this Roman architecture, because, in fact, this architecture shows what is left because they are already rid of all of the uh, materials and so can reveal the actual form of the architecture that Le Corbusier can use to uh, nourish his own work. Now, there's also a more tragic aspect here because it's true that here there are elements that you can recognize the Roman architecture that he has visited and as it is to say, is today, does not give you the real form of the antiquity. When he arrived in Rome, he was quite shocked because it was very difficult for him to isolate the pieces is in fact uh, and identify the archetypes and this gives a new approach to uh, the view of architecture and here he started talking about how the uh, the Roman runes have the capacity to uh, create emotions and this is something we can see in the pictures and postcards he saw he bought in Rome here we see uh, a new interest a different interest which can be seen in these sketches, uh, which are not just pictures uh, to recall the situation, but rather uh, to use them uh, to coordinate. He started using these runes in, from the point of view of the change, because the temple and the temple process had in fact changed the real form. In the same way, in Pompeii, he was luckier because Pompeii is well preserved. And in the visit of, uh, just like with the visit of the Acropolis in Greece, he was able to uh, isolate pieces and discover other things. Because things are well preserved here in Pompeii, he began to see the absence of pieces, the way in which the Roman Domus has preserved most of the rooms, most of the space in the house, but at the same time, it showed another way of organizing space. So he starts representing this in uh, the interior of the Domus, but something else which is quite interesting, this is our postcard, postcard that was bought in Pompeii, and which is rather strange because it shows the existence of something that is no longer there. It shows the, uh, in the imprint of the interior of a building that is no longer there, which has been uh, in imprinted on the facade, which is very interesting in this archaeological space. Something else which is interesting is during his Orient trip to Istanbul, part of the uh, town of Istanbul burned. And so he went to visit this portion of Istanbul that had burned. He took pictures, very interesting uh, pictures, which have been published in various places. But what's especially interesting is the uh, critique of the picture. There's always a lot of power 
because we're able to see the remains of the volumes that have burned and which have left us with nothing but the primary elements. I think that this, uh, these pictures show another type of research which was little by little uh, developed during Le Corbusier's life. The atypical process and uh, the effect of time on objects and architecture. Here, for example, you know, uh, in Arcachon, uh, Le Corbusier is on vacation and he's very happy and he starts collecting objects that he finds interesting because of their shape. Here you have the arc the archetypal process uh, of and the effect of time on shape and form something you see with the passage of time now the archaic uh, uh, process can look at can be seen in how a uh, Luc Corbusier refers to the origin. Here we see the pieces and the brutalism of materials. Here once again we see the uh, effect of time which ruins the material. And this is the first time that we see the fleshing action carried out. Here on the carcass, one of the first uh, systems of Le Corbusier, you see the uh, Athens Acropolis being viewed from afar in a system which is proposed, which is the transformation of a perfect structure, which is modern as well. Here in this apartment, we uh, see, in fact, the absence that he had noticed during Pompeii. Here at the uh, Maison du Lac, you see the absence, which is part of the entire architectural composition of the house. And here, you see a picture of the outside of the house. And this is uh, the vision uh, that he has. We see that there are parts missing, and these missing parts become the image of his architecture. But to achieve these major absences, then we need to uh, look at the work of Le Corbusier to understand that the total absence is seen in most of the projects of Chantigar. Here we see in this first building that it was supposed to be a concrete structure for monumental arcades, which are both structural and image. Here, when you stroll through these buildings, you always get the impression that you're in an archaeological chamber because the exterior and interior are still there. We can feel the absence in smaller types of architecture, like the Shodan house. Or if you look at his house, when you look at the drawings and sketches, we see that in reality, that sense of absence and that sense of subtraction is even stronger. The uh, third form of the archaic in Le Corbusier is the use of brute uh, shapes. Here you see, in fact, the purity he's trying to extract from the materials, the roughness of the stone, for example. Here we've abandoned the period of white houses 
And this house is the result of these projects. And it's quite a strange result, because if you think of the 1930s, Le Corbusier was producing very pure designs that can be seen and that are in line with the classic uh, principles of uh, antique architecture, but he never used these uh, crude raw materials uh, to produce his architecture. If you look at the project for the house at La Selle Saint-Cloud, here again you see the use of the brick, but you have the impression that this space is a ruin. Here you see a house which is impacted by vegetation as well. And this is not a chance uh, effect. And to conclude, we can look at the use of raw concrete here and the use of materials which creates different effects each time. And this so as to obtain an architecture which has already aged. If you look at the assembly building, of Chandigar. If you look at the material, the material aims at representing the strength and the desire to have an architecture which is also which is already aged. Look at the different ways in which he uses concrete. Now I'd like to conclude with an emblematic work which probably summarizes all of the elements I uh, explained. Here you have in fact the attack Towers of Chandigarh. Here you have the absence of rooms, the exhibition of materials, and I think that expresses all of the archaic elements. This is no longer a structure, it is a carcass, no partitioning walls to close space, and nothing is concealing the material. Thank you for your attention.